There are numerous places in the New Testament where scholars believe that gospel writers took ancient hymns and incorporated them or included them in Scripture. The first chapter of the Gospel of John, the piece that precedes the reading that Barbara offered for us earlier, in the prologue, in the beginning was the word, the word grace appears four times there in that chapter, possibly an early hymn. And thereafter in the Gospel of John, we do not hear anything else about the word grace. Perhaps that's just a case of John borrowing a hymn. But maybe, just maybe, it's also an intentional choice. The grace appears in the words explaining the incarnation to us. And then the rest of the gospel is dedicated to showing us what grace actually looks like. Or in other words, the gospel of John is articulating in its very structure that it's one thing to talk about grace and it's another to have an experience of it. It's one thing to know of a spiritual journey and entirely another to live it. Some of us struggle with this balancing act or this journey from head to heart with great frequency. We are asked to perhaps in your job crunch numbers and also, I assume, be emotionally open to others. To think your way around complex problems and then derive pleasure from the simple things in life. To breathe deeply of the morning air. And so it is easy to turn the wedding at Cana into an academic exercise. To make the portion of that narrative a a head exercise. I read a sermon by Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, the 16th century Martin Luther, earlier this week. He discusses this text at length, like he discusses every text at length, (laughs) ensuring that we all understand that, if you were wondering, some dancing at weddings is acceptable. He gave us 4,000 words about the conduct of dancing at weddings and how they should be executed, that one should leave room for the Holy Spirit, that sort of thing. But dancing was actually okay. And then he gave us another 14,000 words, asking questions like, where is Cana anyway? Because nobody actually knows where Cana is. There are tours that you can take in Israel, or so I have heard, where you, you walk from Nazareth to Cana, except that no one's actually sure that the walk you are taking is to the real Cana. There are at least four options, at least four options of where Cana could have been. One of them is in Lebanon, in southern Lebanon. That option was the one promoted by Eusebius, an early church father, fourth century church father. This is a, this is a place now where more than 80% of the population are Muslims. Lebanese Muslims actively promote and advocate for that Cana being the actual site. Perhaps because it's a, a great place to attract pilgrims who will stay in hotels and purchase food and this sort of thing. But the world has become a funny place where Lebanese Muslims are saying, no, 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 this is where Jesus attended a wedding. That Cana in Lebanon is also known for an operation by the Israeli Defense Forces. That operation killed 106 civilians who had fled the violence between IDF and Hezbollah. They fled to a UN compound in Cana to escape all the fighting, were accidentally killed. We could turn this story into a mental exercise then by discussing modern politics and the great shame or the sham that comes with a purported sight of a miracle of Christ where the table is set for all, where Jesus makes merry with all who have gathered, where a miracle is described, where a party that Jesus attended, how that became a grave site for innocence. And such is the tapestry of the gospel, of the good news when it is placed upon the world. It's a topic that can't be ignored, and I try not to. It's a topic that shouldn't be ignored on 
This weekend of all weekends where we celebrate the life and journey of both Martin Luther King and also those who journeyed with him. Like Jesus, it's easy to take the directness of Martin Luther King and make him a sweet soothsayer. We can domesticate what he did and what he had to say, a man who offered gentle sayings and what we might pretend was a relatively stable time. Clearly, Martin Luther King and his legacy has dealt a great injustice if we ignore the prophetic call to not just address racism in our nation, but also what Martin Luther King addressed as a triple threat, that of racism, militarism, and materialism. But I also believe that the wedding in Cana is an invitation into an experience of grace. Not just a discussion about grace, but an experience of epiphany. A remembrance that Christmas, for, for us, people of faith, wasn't that long ago. In fact, the season just recently ended, and we are now in epiphany, still celebrating the coming of God, the inbreaking of grace into the world. We must remember, we must remember that that couple in the story at Cana, they would have started their marriage very badly. They would have been the talk of the town. Their family would have received unending shame if they had not provided enough wine. Jesus didn't just save the party. He saved them. Jesus Jesus toasts with folks who are tired, who are beaten down by poverty, offering cheers, meaning liberation, meaning healing, meaning salvation. To the folks whose lands have been plundered by big vineyard owners, Jesus offers the most exquisite wine more than they could possibly imagine. And if you want to break that down economically, we're talking thousands of dollars, a tab that no one else was going to pick up. And yet, making magic or the cost of the bill is hardly the point here. Epiphany, the manifestation that Jesus is one of us, someone from Nazareth who attends a wedding, who celebrates life and togetherness. Jesus is showing us what God is like, that God has a sense of humor. The best wine for last. God's nearness, God's willingness to mingle with the people. God is not an absentee landlord or the God of the ancient philosophers who was never present. Jesus says, there's no such thing as too close for comfort. Of course, we all bring our own wedding experiences and lay them onto this story as well. Now, I come at this from a different angle than than some of you, at least, in that I have officiated many weddings. I will tell you one thing that you may not know. They don't always go according to plan. (laughs) There was the groom, whose soon-to-be bride left him waiting and waiting and waiting in a black wool suit in the middle of the summer. It became very difficult to tell when she was more than an hour late for her own wedding, whether he was sweating because of the temperature outside or for other reasons. I sometimes, when blessing the rings, take the rings on my stole and I ask either the best man or the the maid of honor to place the rings on top of my stole and then I I I close the stole over them and offer a prayer. And you can already see that that is an invitation to disaster. (laughs) A, A larger gentleman who had a very large ring once placed on my hand, and it didn't just drop to the ground. It went clink, 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 as it rolled on its side away from us. I'll be right back is not a part of the wedding liturgy. (laughs) All of this reminds us that covenantal relationships, covenantal relationships don't always go as planned. 
Covenant is not a contract. Contracts are, and the attorneys in here can correct me later, I believe, conditional or limited. You enter into a contract usually for reasons of self-interest. Covenants aren't legal documents. They are sacred bonds. They can be established between people who are equals, and they can be established between two unequals, such as God and the people. But a covenant is unconditional. Covenant always is supposed to stay in place. As Catherine Willis Percy says, a contract is to covenant as ink is to blood. There are all sorts of examples of covenants between equal parties in Scripture and also unequal parties in the ancient world. Those examples abound. You go all the way back to the 7th century BCE that describe covenantal relationships between unequal parties. The emperor of Assyria, Esar Haddon, seeking to ensure that after he died, his subjects would remain loyal to his son and successor, Assar Banipal, proclaims to them, You will love as yourselves, Assar Banipal. Sounds somewhat familiar? Covenant between unequal parties are intended to endure well beyond life. In the case of Israel, though, the covenant is the defining metaphor for God and God's people. And the threat to that covenant comes from a strong temptation to worship other gods who offer better harvests or richer love or more promising fertility. Covenant in antiquity shifts in meaning from emperor and subject to God and people. And so Jesus comes to this party, and for Christians, our understanding of covenant shifts again. How remarkable it is that Jesus comes to a wedding in covenantal relationship with the people. He behaves differently. He is different than. He is other, because no one else is picking up that tab. And yet also the same. He mingles, he socializes, he hangs out. We have an experience of who Jesus is and what Jesus is like, a covenantal partner that understands that the relationship isn't equal and yet celebrates the unequal covenant by not allowing the married couple and their families to dwell in shame. They are invited to remain at peace, to remain in joy, to celebrate the unexpected, to delight in the fact that this wedding does not go according to plan. And most of them don't. The day that I was married, the gentleman who married us, my mentor, Sammy Clark, offered in his sermon some wise words to Stacy, myself, He said, someday you will know each other so well that you will be able to finish each other's sentences. Never do that in public. (laughs) He also invited us to remember that our marriage wasn't about the wedding day at all, that it would continue, that the peace that we shared would carry on the next day and the next day and the next day. Now, in our wedding service, we didn't want to have a religious service that led up to the, you may now kiss the bride, not that there's anything wrong with that, but we always have felt like in religious services, when there is a lead up to an invitation to make out in church, it just seems a little odd. So what we did was we uh, framed that moment of the service around the passing of the peace. So Sammy said, may God's peace be with you to Stacy and to me. And we shared that peace with one another. And the intent was, because this is a, a public profession and a public uh, a celebration of joy, to then turn to our families and to share the peace with them. And so the intent was for I to turn to my parents and say, peace be with you, mom and dad. And for Stacy to do the same on her side. And so I said, peace be with you to Stacy," And we kissed. And I said, peace be with you, mom. 
She gave me a hug, kissed me on the cheeks. Lovely. Peace be with you, Dad. And then my sister reached in for a hug. And I said, oh, yes, of course. Peace be with you, Allie. And I have another sister. Peace be with you, Katie. And then my Uncle John reached out his hand. Oh, peace be with you, Uncle John. Okay, peace be with you, Uncle Stephen. Peace be with you, Auntie Lynn. Uh, sorry, Auntie Hillary, and so on down the line. And then the next row of people reached out their hands. <laughs> and so it went. The never-ending peace be with you. And what had seemed like a mistake turned into a memorable metaphor. The never-ending peace be with you. It sounds like the beginning of our worship services sometimes, doesn't it? But what seems like a mistake usually isn't. Who in their right mind saves the best wine for last? You are doing it all wrong. Who in their right mind raises up a prophet from among the people in Georgia? Georgia? Who raises up a man who in the face of police brutality and in the nonviolent fight for rights says, everybody can be great. Everybody can be great. Because anybody can serve. Thank God Martin Luther King Jr. took his inspiration from the Beatitudes. He said, you don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know the second law of of thermodynamics to serve. I love that line. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. Surely Martin Luther King looked upon this wedding and saw the peace that is shared and never ends. The clinking of glasses that shares liberation and healing and hope to all who are gathered. It is not an academic exercise, this grace thing. It is an experience, the journey from the head to the heart. For everything is spiritual. And in God's realm, this thing that we sometimes refer to as the kingdom of heaven, what I'll call God's realm, is just grace upon grace upon grace. It just keeps going and going and going like this wedding. A peace never ending for one and for all, for this people and for all peoples. May God's peace be with you.